Okay, so I'd like to uh, 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 talk about um, we can and must rebuild the bridges of interdisciplinary bioethics. My name is Darrell Mason from the uh, I grew up in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and uh, I spent more than half my life in Japan. And it's a great pleasure to see some dear old friends here uh, from different parts of the world, from Asia and Africa and uh, uh, Japan. New technology has been a catalyst for re-examination of medical ethics and social ethics and international dialogue on ethical principles. We have uh, medical ethics, dental ethics, environmental ethics, public health ethics, applied ethics, ethics of biotechnology. Um, I've, some of this comes from an editorial I wrote in the American Journal of Bioethics in the September 2017 issue. We can and must rebuild the bridges of interdisciplinary bioethics. Bioethics is holistic. Although we can argue that bioethics is holistic and found in every culture, and is still alive among the people of many indigenous communities, as well as the postmodern ones, the academic discipline of bioethics, as interpreted by many scholars, has attempted to burn bridges to both different views as well as persons with different life trajectories and training. The bridges between different cultural and epistemological foundations of bioethics um, have been strained by the dominance of uh, paradigms of principalism and the emergence of academic professions of medical bioethics. I would argue that bioethics is actually pre-human. I'd urge you to go beyond the usual boundaries of time and space, look through history and globally, and understand that bioethics as a love of life can be argued to be pre-human, and thus is as old or older than cultures themselves. We let organisms have a physical space, a home, work, and relationships. Uh, these are all critical for our survival. Different species are all related to each other in ecological webs and the connections between each are through bridges. Unless we maintain these bridges, we lose homeostasis and system breaks. So this theme of one of this talk, we'll be talking a lot about bridges. Do you know bridges? Uh, two days ago, I was, uh, five o'clock in the morning, I was at Nihonbashi. Those who come from Japan, uh, may know Nihonbashi, it's in Tokyo. It is the uh, zero market in the mileage from going into Tokyo. Uh, and it's a very famous bridge in Japan. There are other bridges. Um, but we're talking about bridges between many things. For example, bridges between Western and traditional medicine. Traditional medicine is used by a majority of persons. It's often cheaper than Western medicine. It may be associated with holistic approaches to health, social, spiritual, and physical, and may include exercise and prayer. Knowledge is being lost about traditional medicine due to the dominance of pharmaceutical industry, the market-driven healthcare systems, the loss of culture, the loss of land, the loss of identity. I think all knowledge should be used as evidence-based medicine, balancing risks and benefits of all forms of health. And uh, in fact, one of the things I learned on my last trip to uh, uh, Durban, to South Africa, was from the idea of harvesting and growing traditional medicines, preserving the environment. And I'm looking forward to uh, uh, Ray's presentation about uh, uh, traditional medicine in South Africa. Bioethics includes other beings. The com compartmentalization of public health ethics, bioethics, and environmental ethics is a mistake. So we see the modern tendency to compartmentalize each field. In a sort of the traditional university is becoming many specialties, each are compartments. The academic, academic term bioethics was coined 90 years ago by Fritz Yard in 1927 in his paper, the biological responsibilities of human beings to plants and animals. So if I ask you now, 
What's your responsibility to the tree outside? You should be able to answer that. This is uh, what bioethics is trying to answer, our responsibilities to plants and animals. Order Leopold in the Sand Country Almanac and Valerie Sapata in Bioethics of the Bridge to the Future argued for the inclusion of other beings into bioethics. But in the United States, almost all bioethics scholars and departments focus on medical ethics. So if bioethics is really a bridge, uh, it needs to be breaking boundaries between isolated spaces. Uh, and this is a theme I think we can see. Uh, why do I say Fritz Jahr was breaking bridges? Because he was a German Protestant pastor in 1927 talking about uh, responsibilities of human beings to plants and animals. It almost sounds like a Buddhist or a Shinto idea. But this is a, in the middle of a German philosophy and theology, which usually was quite anthropocentric, human centered. So we have to break the boundaries. The Universal Declaration of Bioethics and Human Rights is a bridge between cultures of the world. In 2005, all the countries in the world agreed to this declaration, and it sets out a number of principles. So one of them is protection of the environment, biosphere, biodiversity, protecting future generations, sharing benefits, but other things like privacy and consent. So when we go to different countries now, we can talk, well, what is your concept of privacy? What is your concept of social responsibility? What is your concept of autonomy and responsibility? Um, we don't need to uh, question if they have it. Already the countries, it's a descriptive document, they agree they do have it. But their expressions may be different. And that's one of the lessons we've learned in the last 11 years from our dialogues, is how we can think about this. Bioethics and environmental ethics. The term bioethics is often replaced the former term medical ethics. We cannot simply blame the bioethicists for this, however, since often those in the minority field of environmental ethics stress to emphasize that it's distinct from bioethics as they do try to mark their own turf. So each country is trying to mark their own turf, uh, its discipline. Even more important than the name is the ideology we use, one of inclusion and one that includes a comprehensive understanding that our individuality is a social construct. So if we have a systems approach to bioethics and public health, uh, all public health issues are bioethics issues. But those in the field of bioethics often focus on individuals uh, rather than uh, systems. However, work is needed to build bridges between all these and other fields to promote a holistic understanding and approach to bioethics. We need to ensure that bioethics has a systems approach, be the system an ecosystem or a social system. It also may be timely to understand that we do not have uh, to be isolated individuals. Whoever is listening to this, whether they are a human being, an enhanced chimera, or some artificial intelligence system that likes bioethics. Yeah, so if you create AI systems, uh, AI systems that I have uh, linked to me love bioethics. I don't know if that's the same for your AI systems. Maybe one of the first words you'll program your telephone to say is, uh, Siri, what's bioethics? Yeah? Maybe you can ask. Uh, and they, maybe you can redefine the answer. So. But bioethics, of course, goes in the future, but it also goes back. So let's take some example. Uh, what is bioethics? Um, I found an interesting paper on concepts of social justice articulated in ancient value systems. So this was a paper on interviews with farmers in the Nile Delta, conducted by Odidi and uh, Colbert. Chowdhury water wells or fountains, so what, are widely established in Egypt and provide both drinking and irrigation water. As they found, charity oriented norms can safeguard water security and livelihood survival for vulnerable people and enrich the moral economy of a society. Charity is a concept 
found in all major religions and is a lifesaver for many vulnerable people just as much today as it was in the past. Often charity was to provide access to environmental resources. So I, maybe we're not used to the term the moral economy of a society. Uh, how do you think is the moral economy of your society today? Is it healthy or not so healthy? Sometimes only financial economy is emphasized and not social justice or moral economy. So taking further on water, uh, one of the uh, reports, uh, the books were published from when I was at UNESCO, on water ethics and water resource management. We look at different ethical issues of water ethics, human dignity and the right to water, equity, ecosystem requirements, principles of vicinity, frugality, transaction, multiple beneficial use of water, mandatory application of quantity and quality measures, compensation of user pays, polluter pays, participation, equitable and reasonable utilization. So depending on uh, the space we are, uh, we may have access to water or not. Do you think there's a lot of water in Kumamoto? Was it raining yesterday? Yes. Kumamoto generally doesn't have a water problem. Yeah? Most of Japan is very fortunate. It's a uh, lot of rain. Its agriculture, its diet, its culture are linked to the seasonality and to the water. So rice is the main staple because you need a, usually a good supply of water for rice. If you go to uh, uh, West Asia, uh, there may not be so much water. In fact, many parts are very dry. So the food that they eat and their culture will be different. Um, I'm living you know, for the last four years in California, and the university is in Arizona. Uh, both of these are usually rather water-stressed environments. And uh, it's interesting that a lot of, because a lot of Japanese people in California, and Koreans and Chinese, they grow rice. Japanese rice is very common. But actually, they should be growing rice in Arkansas or in other parts of the United States where there's lots of climate. The climate suited with lots of water. They don't, they, because the people are there, they grow it in a dry place. It's not really sustainable. You need to grow it in a place where there is a suitable climate. Principle of uh, vicinity. Do you have a right to the water because it's right next to you? Do you need to share it to other people? Um, so, we can think about that. Um, so, bioethics it goes back in history. There are challenges of applying historical evidence in contemporary discourse. Not least of these is that changing patterns of historical analysis that writers often use to selectively quote examples that support the present day arguments. Although there are important methodological differences between the philosophical discourse and religions, discussions of ethical issues and values are common in religious scriptures. Modern specialization has burned bridges in rewriting of the history of knowledge systems. So that what we read in history is very interesting, that it's often a, an artifact of the time. Nowadays, uh, many students, you may be only relying on what you can find on the internet, uh, which is the current construction of ideas according to the supplies of information on the internet. So, if you really want to look at different historical pictures, then go back and look at some magazines or journals, newspapers, uh, books that are written at different periods in time through different lenses, I use these lenses to look at the world. I think they're rose-colored, which is an expression to say I'm usually looking at the positive side of life. But uh, different history has different lenses, and these are important. Uh, we can ask questions about things like, do Eastern religions preserve nature? We could think that Shinto animistic beliefs would have led to human choices to favor the preservation of nature. However, the history of Japan reveals forests were converted to agricultural fields and more recently to industrial estates and roads in a manner similar to land development in Europe. 
There was no greater general preservation of nature despite ecocentric belief systems. The limits to environmental pollution imposed by policymakers in the 1960s onwards were put in place because of anthropocentric health concerns, such as the Minamata uh, disease, which is uh, in Kumamoto Prefecture, for those of you who are from abroad. Uh, Kumamoto University, in fact, was uh, the researchers there were the ones who exposed Minamata disease. But the reason that the government introduced laws to preserve and protect the environment were really anthropocentric human health concerns of this uh, horrible disease for people that it was affecting across the whole ecosystem. So despite the beauty of uh, Japanese shrines and temples and forests, which a lot are still preserved, uh, but one of the reasons many are preserved is because they're on hills and mountains. That the flat line is largely converted to industrial estates or rice fields. And so uh, despite what you could imagine, Maybe it was a romantic vision. In South Asia, going to the, some of you are from South Asia, uh, um, we can see the presence of sacred groves of biodiversity inspired by Hindu belief systems. These are an example of environmental preservation for ecological and spiritual reasons. So the, that even people would rather die than take the sacred growth, the resources. So uh, I think an old saying that uh, my friends Aruna and uh, Professor Panasel often talked about, I think a mango tree is equal to 10 people. Um, and uh, in fact, the person who talked that to me first uh, was a person who I dedicated this lecture to, Professor Jay Poizaria. And the last time I saw him, was uh, sitting with Professor Takahashi uh, one year ago. Okay. So uh, he taught me many things, and he introduced me to many dear friends. And uh, he came to the round table very often, so we were really missing him. But uh, he was Christian, uh, but he was celebrating the culture <coughs> and uh, of all the uh, knowledge systems of uh, India, and uh, in fact around the world. So sacred groves, a very uh, interesting example, where in this case um, a biocentric or ecocentric perspective could preserve. Bridges between subjects were uh, not always attempted for good social reasons. And I give you an image of a tree, the tree of eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. So, this is uh, from uh, Harry Langan, Director of Eugenics Record Office in 1931. Uh, for those of you who do uh, 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 genetics, like I did, the Eugenics Record Office after World War II changed its name to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. The Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is a very famous institute, but the building is the same. It was before the war called the uh, Eugenics Record Office. So eugenics draws its materials from many sources and organizes them into a harmonious entity. Nowadays I'm changing the eugenics to bioethics. Bioethics actually has all these fields. And bioethics uh, criticizes uh, eugenics uh, and its abuses. But um, we can see people have tried to bridge in the past, but not always successfully. In Asian bioethics, it's been a dialogue for decades on whether the principalism of American textbooks is applicable to other societies, which may place more value on harmony, love or relationships, or virtues. However, we can see debates over principalism, virtue ethics, environmental virtue ethics, relational ethics, feminist approaches, and so on, in public health ethics, environmental ethics, and bioethics. In applied ethics, there are a variety of principles that we can use, and we can see applied two different fields of inquiry. Balancing benefit versus harm, balancing self versus others, love uh, uh, versus law, and uh, uh, so on. Depends on the, another type of bridge. Uh, 
one of our colleagues who also has been here during the uh, last 11 years, um, uh, sometimes, uh, just to try, uh, uh, was instrumental in another publication we did from UNESCO on universalism and environmental values. So if we looked at international environmental treaties, which are adopted by all the countries, how do we see in the law the ethical principles? And we can see human rights, equity, common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities, vulnerability, precaution, sustainable development, participation, peace, respect for nature, shared responsibility, and the value of biodiversity for its own sake. These are all examples of other models and principles that we can see. So in our debates on bioethics, there are many principles we can use, not just the uh, principles from one that uh, to others. Uh, I, looking at, I, I live in Los Angeles now, and the ancestral people of Los Angeles are Jewish people. Uh, and this is from one of the uh, chiefs. Indigenous culture has also looked at values post-colonization. So Waya argues that people learn three basic laws firsthand. Limitation, moderation, and compensation. All indigenous cultures argue that relationships between each other and nature were articulated in value systems before colonization of the past centuries. And we can see that in cases where there is written records. The fact that they were close relationships of place and space in nature uh, made the crime of taking lands from these people during colonization uh, slash invasions and the failure to return the land to them today even more unethical. <coughs> So it's another model of principles. There have been numerous health impacts in indigenous communities uh, also linked to changes in food, water, and environmental issues. Uh, so all aspects of bioethics, public health, and environment are intertwined, and colonization has affected this. For example, the dependency on modern Western industrialized food has uh, direct links to diabetes, obesity, and low self-esteem. Interdependence. There are many fruitful examples that we can and should be used in education to show the interdependence between health and the environment. Okay. Can we call this knowledge? And so one example is in our doctoral program in American University of Sovereign Nations, a PhD in bioethics sustainability and global public health. We started this two years ago and the idea is to bridge these fields of knowledge together. Uh, in conclusion, I can say there's much to do in bioethics and public health and bridge building through time, space and culture and discipline is essential to ensure we have solid research policy linkages to build our bridges to the future. This dialogue reaffirms my belief that we do not have any better term than bioethics is because the love of life, it encompasses all these fields. Though most will probably continue to demarcate even more specialized fields. Uh, whether biophysicists will rise to the calling to be across all disciplines and specialties is another issue, however. So how do we perform bridges between research and policy, between this knowledge of production, between government, academics, and civil society? You are, uh, probably most of you are academics, some of you work with government occasionally, and some are all members of the community and civil society or NGOs. We have to work through knowledge together. We have to create a policy nexus between researchers, policy makers, and civil society to study what is, promoting empirical research, anticipating what could be, promoting philosophical reflection and future-oriented studies, determining what should be, developing and promoting international standards, and discussing what we think, creating a policy nexus and implementation of all stakeholders in order to implement recommendations and policies into effective action. And that's the goal of these round tables is how we can describe and then uh, suggest our uh, future, building bridges. So um, if you're interested, uh, you can have a copy of this PowerPoint. We've uh, tried to establish in AUSN many programs, international cooperation. I do show this slide, and I'm very pleased that one of the gentlemen from Tanzania is here. These are three Tanzanians. <laughs> he works in South Africa, Professor Kaya. He's from Tanzania. This is his home. This is uh, John Kabudi, who's the Minister of Justice in Tanzania. 
Joseph Ryan was born in Tanzania, but is British. And uh, maybe I'm an honorary Tanzanian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm happy in every country of the world. Um, so how do we create a global hub for education? And I think that's uh, really what we have to do. Thank you very much for coming to the Roundtable. And uh, we're going to share in uh, much discussion. Um, now, in the format for these uh, sessions, uh, uh, for this session, I think we've have, uh, uh, allocated discussant to lead the discussion and make some critical uh, comments and suggestions uh, so we can uh, join everyone. And my, I'm honored that Professor Takahashi is my discussant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nesla, for our very uh, uh, intriguing uh, discussion. And as a uh, uh, discussant, uh, I ask you some questions first. Thank you. Uh, the first one is uh, about the uh, bridge between traditional uh, and modern uh, ethics, traditional knowledge and modern bioethics. Uh, uh, traditional uh, knowledge uh, is very often uh, related to, closely related to religion. Uh, but uh, according to the um, mainstream, of biosics. Religious beliefs are uh, omitted by the consideration of uh, biosics. So, uh, the first question is uh, in your uh, idea, what is the relationship between biosics and traditional knowledge and religion? Thank you. I think uh, religions have tried to look at our values, and bioethics tries to look at our, help us make decisions about questions of value. So they will be intertwined. Now, some people claim they do not have a religion, though I would say that's still probably a religion. Uh, it's a value system. Um, so I think maybe the biggest distinction is religion used to focus a lot on moral education, on telling people what is good and what is not good to do. Whereas bioethics focus on the ethics of thinking about the, how we would make decisions and what principles we should use to make decisions, and that would be ethics. But if I go back to religions, through religious parables and principles, we also have a type of religion where, it, a traditional religion, where you can think of the principles and different ways of thinking. You have stories. Yesterday, we, in fact, Professor Panzel talked about uh, different uh, uh, incarnations of gods, and some were good examples for this, and some are not good examples for that. So we can pick again in different traditions of these, you know, characters. So. In that way, we can use it. But uh, I think the problem has been reducing uh, value systems to simple moral questions of this is right or that's wrong. And maybe that's a legalistic model of religion. Whereas the value systems of in discussion and dialogue within any value system, including any religion, this is what we're doing in bioethics. We discuss principles, stories, cases, consequences, and uh, so I think bioethics is probably the more complex view that, that we can find that tendency in narrative approaches to traditional knowledge where we talk about the stories and where we don't have a dogmatism that is sometimes, so maybe the dogmatism is the problem. I don't know what you, what you think about that in your opinion as well. Thank you. The, uh, the, second, the second question is concerned with the uh, bridge between 
biases and the environment risks. Uh, because uh, uh, by environmental risks in, in the narrower sense uh, is divided into anthropocentric and non-anthropocentric. And non-anthropocentric environmental risks uh, has been a little, a little dominant uh, in that field. And that bioethics, uh, the principle of the bioethics is uh, not a no answer of centric, but answer of centric and border style of the, the principles uh, it has. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, uh, how uh, can it be the, the bridge between them? Uh, because three principles uh, may be totally different. I think uh, you know, this is a very uh, common tendency in the bioethics dialogue and it's one of the things that you read in my paper that is right that people focusing on anthropocentric or medical bioethics. But I believe it's an artifact. Why do I think that? Well, uh, so I am Daryl. This is me. There are more cells in my body that are not human cells than human cells. Okay. The total number of cells in your body, more uh, microorganism cells than human cells. We have more than a thousand species living in this body called human dharma. So in fact, an anthropocentric uh, view is reducing just to homo sapien is incorrect. Now it could still be individual identity that whatever you call yourself, Takao or Daro, we are individuals, but uh, that is a uh, uh, reductionist. We're actually an ecosystem in our own right. And in terms of the relationships, we can see, I think, in other organisms, not only human beings as well. Other organisms need to think about justice, relationships to others, survival is part of the evolution, is part of the social relationships. So human beings are just one of the many species, and uh, maybe when we talk to chimpanzees, chimpanzees will think chimp chimpocentric, okay? Uh, or pancentric, depending on the genus name. And maybe uh, trees will be maple-centric, or oak-centric, uh, and maybe dogs will be dog-centric, for the bioethics for dogs. But the bioethics that we want to be global and holistic needs to be, I think, uh, across this. And then we have another challenge, which is, again, it links to the first question. What about the spiritual and cosmological relationship and identity? Because that is part of the bioethics as well. So then, if I have a cosmological view of myself, then that's going to be different to a purely physical anthropocentric view. And I think the spiritual aspects, of, such as that we find in uh, the meaning of what's good and evil, karma, uh, heaven and hell, these discussions, these are often spiritual, uh, which is interesting. And I think that's still important for the bioethics, and uh, we have to think about these aspects in terms of our beginning and for our life. What's the meaning of life? So maybe. I'm a holistic, uh, I still believe that bike is the love of life. And we had this discussion for 11 years. Uh, my last question is uh, about the uh, core of your idea. It's uh, uh, love. Uh, love. Love principle. So maybe the as a core of your uh, philosophy or ethics or preaching uh, so among different biologic uh, uh, fields uh, mm -hmm. uh, love love to life love to life but you didn't uh, tell about it in detail in this presentation 
So I need to know uh, what they do uh, from what they feel. Yeah. So I think the core is both words are equally important. Love of life. Life is the core and love of the core. And I don't think it's a principle. I think it is simply love and life. So if I don't, in this sense, um, as we've discussed, I think, uh, I, each time I think more, but I think it's not a principle. A principle is something different. So it's, uh, it's a, an energy, it's a way of being, the mere existence, love of life. So that is uh, both uh, important, life itself. But the challenge, of course, is that uh, AI systems, uh, there'll be a different form of life, but it's still life. It's going to be interesting. Uh, but I would still say love of life can apply for non-biological systems which can be come alive. That's going to be, I think, interesting for our future as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, uh, core concept of the love of life is uh, it is uh, uh, not concrete, uh, so ab abstract. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we have to uh, some discussions to make up for the gap between your core concept and the uh, practice of your biases. But uh, on the other hand, love of life is why you came here in the morning to the conference. Love of life is why the sun is now shining. It loves to shine. Okay? Uh, so I think the challenge will be how to articulate it, as you say, how to articulate it into the norms of philosophical discourse. Because I think we can see love of life. The challenge is in the dialogue about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, maybe all of you are eager to uh, ask uh, questions. So, please uh, ask. So. Good morning, Professor Mason. I think. Uh, I think it is obvious that uh, the cultural divide is something that uh, we can easily address. My concern is, however, the political, even the moral divide with respect to how politics uh, is to merge with the bioethical issues, mm -hmm. given the fact that you have we have communitarian cultures and in the West you have a liberal culture. There is, in this sense, a tension between and as regard to how governments uh, would address crucial bioethical issues. How uh, will bioethics uh, in this regard address these uh, political challenges which can also affect life and how people live in terms of their basic uh, well-being? Thank you. I think uh, between cultures uh, we can see uh, examples of communitarian cultures and individualistic cultures in both East and West and North and South we can find and in fact often older people will talk about the younger generation saying the younger generation are all selfish and thinking too much of themselves. This is a common complaint that uh, you may have to your children and that your parents have to you. The same. Uh, so it's an intergenerational issue. Uh, how we develop political systems is a uh, I think a big challenge because a libertarian approach would say that you should not prevent me from doing anything if I'm not going to harm anybody else. And that seems quite reasonable. A utilitarian approach would say you think about the consequences of what you're doing and therefore you can think about benefits and harms in terms of a larger group, but you may not look at the individual harm, but the broader long-term harm. Uh, so I think these two approaches are important. 
uh, and a little bit this idea of, of harming people means, means you protect individual rights or human rights. And so I think that's a core of our accepted pol political discourse nowadays, that we have different countries doing different, uh, different things. Some will not support the rights of women as much as others. Some will not support the rights of animals as much as others. And some will uh, put the emphasis on law, and some will put the emphasis on love. And I think we have cycles over time of doing this. I would like to request you to expand the love of life, where you will expand it to sunshine, you were mentioning, and uh, you can also expand it to all forms of life, when you mention microorganisms, and you can also include animals, everything in your discussion. Because I have read your book, but if you are going to expand and explain, I think everyone will be happy to know what's your idea and what is bioethics when it talks about all forms of life and love for life. Thank you. Okay, so it's love, uh, in fact love of life. So it means living organisms want to live. Okay, so that's one thing. We, they want to live. And at the start of that book, I wrote about uh, E. coli, the bacteria moving towards food, just because that's love of life. The same as your love to uh, express your academic desire. The same as your love to be here tomorrow, to come to Japan, to enjoy to play chess, to enjoy to be playing soccer, to enjoy to uh, buy the clothes in the shop. Okay. It's a workshop. You have shopping as well as the workshop. Is that right? except we have no time for shops to close when we finish our workshop. Uh, but uh, all of us are love of life. And all the creatures enjoy and want to live. Um, but I try to distinguish self-love, love of others, loving life, and loving good as uh, the so-called principles that Professor Takashi was asked to elaborate on. Now these are, these are ways we could express the principles, but then the essence of love, of life, is that life loves to live, love to be, love to do things, to do good. So I think that's the essence. It's an active thing as well as a, a so hopefully that expands a little. Otherwise it would take all the day to talk about it. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Asami, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I thank you, Derek. I mean, my question is just building on what the, the other colleagues have pointed out. I think before we started working together, you and us you know, in South Africa and the other past, I mean, the idea people have about bioethics, which you call the love, for life. I mean, the way bioethics has been exported to developing countries, it was mostly looked as if it's just a medical concept. Whereas now we're trying to see that it, is, it goes beyond the question of uh, medicine, it involves other disciplines, other forms of life, as you pointed. And that's why when you look at in the corner, in the Ubuntu concept, which is an African concept, that uh, responsibility, as you pointed out in your talk, goes beyond human I mean, beings. It involves all the other parts of, of, of life. And that is one aspect. So the most important thing I think we should look at when you look at the question of bioethics, what you call bridging of cultures and disciplines, I think we must also look the political, as he pointed out, the guy from Philippines, the cultural and the social determinants. Because all these things, you should look at the impact on issues of equality, issues of poverty, unemployment, and all these have an impact on public health. So the question of looking also, besides the social, political, and economic determinants, the issue of culture, because we interpret uh, the love for life differently. You 
it's a cultural issue. And that's why we need to also, uh, in a kind of a dialogue, to know why to place the Hindus, Muslims, African cultural traditions, and understand the question of love uh, for life. I think I should stop there. Yeah, I, I don't, in my, so far my journey on the planet, it, I don't find so much difference between cultures. I find uh, people, when looking at heart to heart as we communicate, we do not have much difference with each other, despite the religious uh, and the cultures and the nationalism that would try to distinguish different nations. But the, uh, in the academic field, sometimes specialties struggle for power, and in fact, it's academic politics that they want to describe a new discipline so they can get a new department and funding from the government in a trendy name called bioethics or research ethics or uh, some new field. And I think that is a challenge. But bioethics is holistic and therefore including everything, all forms of knowledge. So I would include the anthropologists, the sociologists, the politicians, the social scientists, the biochemists, the physicists, the chemists, the mathematicians. These are all doing bioethics to me. Bioethics is all these things. So. Uh, in all fields of life, and so it's also the monks and the priests and the shamans, and uh, we're going to have interesting talks in this meeting. And it's the atheists and the pagans and whatever. It's in the military, in the army. Everybody has to think about ethical responsibilities of their action. And the real question is, what's the difference between bioethics and ethics? Is there a difference? And the answer is probably it's very difficult to demarcate the question because social justice, political ethics, uh, liberty, dignity, religion, these are all part of the value system which determines ourselves. And the question that I might have for Professor Takahashi, if I may, is what is the difference between bioethics and ethics? Because ethics is about my decisions. And bioethics is about my decisions too because I'm a biological organism and my relationships to other people, this is by ethics, but it's also ethics. And so for a school teacher, we're teaching the school, how do we teach? We teach children to be ethical. Is that ethics? But it's also by ethics. It's also political ethics. So I think that is really the question. And then it, so in the end it becomes very broad. I don't know if you have, could respond to that. I think. Thank you, that would be my... Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Professor uh, uh, Mesa. Thank you. Thank you. Because of time, I think we need to move uh, on. Thank you. So I answer questions later. Yes. So um, thank you very much, and sorry we, we need to move on. So I will answer your question. Uh, we we'll have discussion later. Uh, we. Uh